Welcome to the podcast. How's it going today? Hey, good, great, excellent weather in Melbourne. Yeah, how's it over there? <laughs> cool, co co completely other side of the world. You're in Melbourne right now. I'm in Montreal, which is exactly the opposite, pretty much. So, what I like to ask my guests first usually is, what is one quote that inspires you? I guess in the investment and trading world, I would say that from experience, the quote will be, "Those who talk don't really know. Those who know." Don't usually talk. <laughs> I like it. I like it. It's good. I've heard that many times, but it's really good for investing. Cool. Tell us a little bit what's going on these days in your life and what you're up to, basically. Well, after spending almost 20 plus years around Asia Pacific, uh, I've worked in Seoul in Korea, I've worked in Hong Kong, worked in Singapore, I worked in mainland China, I worked in Sydney. So I've been bouncing around quite a bit. Um, and finally, um, earlier this year, we've decided to settle back in Melbourne, Australia. So um, as you can see, I'm sitting in my, um, my home at the moment, just enjoying the lovely spring weather. Uh, so, you know, we're settling back in and um, enjoying the place. I'm curious to know a little bit because we've talked a little bit before and Mandy Parafjani, which I had on the podcast before, told me a little bit about you. She told me a little bit about the story and what you've been up to. But I'm curious to know, how did you get involved in trading in the first place? Yeah, yeah, it was actually a really lucky but strange path I took. Because uh, as you know, I, I pretty much grew up in uh, country Victoria over here in Australia. I grew up in a little town with 4,000 people. So it was big, far away from the big metropolis financial world. And, um, but after my first economics degree, um, I started working in a, uh, as a trainee marine insurance underwriter for a company called Zurich Insurance here in Melbourne. Nine months of that, I knew that this was not the path I want to take for the career. And uh, it was just very dull, a lot of documentation and a lot of phone calls just discussing minor details, etc. So I took the big risk. I, I went with my girlfriend. I said, well, let's go to Hong Kong, uh, the origin, <laughs> the big financial hub. I said, I'll give myself three months to look for a job and look for a career path. If I fail within three months, I'll come back and do whatever. Uh, after two and a half months uh, over there, I was lucky enough to land off something Got a call from a uh, German merchant bank at that time called SLB. And out of 300 people who put in their CV, and I think it was like five rounds of interviews, I was lucky enough to land myself a dealer trainee job. So this was a program they picked two uh, youngsters and uh, literally a 12 months training program around the dealing room. So I went to the ethics side, the interest rate side, even the back offices, the sales, the private banking, everything. Uh, after 12 months training, I, uh, I settled in uh, spot ethics and uh, looking after the night desk orders and that. Um, so I had to work nighttime uh, for about six months. So that was my entry into the trading world. <laughs> <laughs> and how was it from there? Because I know a lot of people get involved in trading first. Maybe they succeed, maybe they don't succeed at first, but then they kind of crash after some time. Was it like that for you or was it pretty much good from the start? Well, it was tricky, right? I mean, a lot of pressure, um, a lot of intensity, especially if you don't know anything, right? Going in green and it was very tough. But I was very lucky in a way. After a training program and six months there, I, a big bang actually uh, decided to look at my CV and took me on. HSBC Hong Kong at that time has something like 250 people in their huge dealing room. And I, I was recruiting to the spot ethics desk, learning from the best. Uh, the, back then it was the dollar mark, uh, the, the dollar yen. So I, I sat between those two uh, market makers and learned from that. The mark yen at that day has still had a, a arbitrage system where uh, you use this electronic brokerage uh, system, EBS, and they would arbitrage between the two. So it was quite an adventure. It was very good stuff. I still remember the first time I, I, I was asked to um, call out on the Reuters during this system to um, to purchase dollar yen for for a customer. It was literally like 10 of us going out and hitting the market once and I hit the wrong side. <laughs> it was the scariest anything. Uh, it was basically um, a, a lot of uh, intuition and experience gained from that. 
I later on then settled into a um, taking over the Malaysian Ringgit NDF book. Uh, and that was during the Asian crisis, 97. That was a very scary time. Uh, pretty much we, uh, I remember we started at 6 a.m. in the morning helping the, the central banks around Asia to defend their currencies uh, against the big funds like Soros and Tiger Funds, who used the investment banks, uh, U.S. investment banks against us. And I worked till something like midnight almost every day of the week. <laughs> it was a very scary moment. <laughs> but during 1998, um, when the, the, the ringgit was packed against the dollar, um, I literally lost my role straight away overnight. And uh, I was lucky enough to be transferred into interest rate derivatives desk, um, where I helped to uh, learn and look after the structurings, the IRS, interest rate swap, futures, money market, etc. So that was excellent. Um, I spent five years at HSBC, and um, it was much big memories. I was then um, uh, lucky enough to get another venture uh, came along. I was recruited by Citibank in Hong Kong at that time. They were actually merging uh, with uh, Solomon's with Barney. So Solomon Brothers is the, the star of Lies Poker, the book uh, written and got famous uh, by Michael Lewis. Um, so, you know, that their fixed income sales, you know, were like the big shots, the huge players in the U.S. bond market. Um, I was create. Uh, I was hired to, to into a new role where I, I combined the risk appetite of the Asian market on the Citibank platform, as well as the sales force from the fixed income guys from the Soli, Solomon uh, uh, sales team. I was just running between two dealing rooms every day. It was like they were not merged into one building at that time. So that was fascinating. It was a lot to learn. <laughs> yeah. And how is it at that time? I'm curious because were you trading the whole time or were you doing some different kind of jobs? Well, you had to be trading because like, basically you structure these products to be uh, sold by the sales guys. But there's risk with those products, right? There's credit risk associated. There's interest rate risk associated. Sometimes there's foreign exchange risk associated as well because I could be selling a Hong Kong dollar um, structure. I could be selling a, a, a Roman B structure or a euro structure versus the dollar, etc. And because I was based in Hong Kong, the balance sheet is actually in Hong Kong dollars. So with all these structures that goes through, I actually have foreign exchange risk, I have interest rate risk, I actually have volatility risk as well, because as you try to um, enhance the yield of these structures, basically uh, you also have optionality uh, put into it where uh, the customer sells you an option to enhance the yield and boost up the yield for these structures. So you're basically hedging against the product that you sell? Uh, I think so, yes. Okay. Could you tell us like what a day would be like of someone in an institution like this, a trader? Is it interesting? Is it kind of, does it get boring over time or what does that look like? Well, apart from running between the two places, <laughs> which exhausts you a bit. I mean, having morning meetings with solely sales and then going back to manage risk and see painful. The day is never boring, right? And pretty much um, what I learned from the mentor is basically that you have to be ready when the markets start to move. Uh, you can't just get ready when it does. So um, so there's a lot of reading into it. There's a lot of learning into it. Um, you have to know which structures uh, to to price. You have to understand in individual swaptionalities, the optionalities in the market. You have to be prepared on different credits, new issues that comes out. You just literally have to do 80% preparation before the market moves and probably 20% it's the trading itself. Mm -hmm. Cool. And yeah. what kind of preparation do you do? Is it something you do on your own or with the team? or? Uh, you do have to work with team. Uh, obviously, you work with various traders. There's F FX traders that you offload the risk to. There's optionality traders. You also work with brokers, obviously, interbank brokers, where they quote the prices for you offload the risk. And then you have to work with salespeople, especially in large institution banks like uh, City and Solly. Uh, their sales force were just huge and very aggressive. So you have to constantly be liaising with them and uh, get up to date from what their customer needs are and they get updates from you on what the market's actually uh, demanding and supplying. Mm -hmm. And what would be one of your biggest failures working in an institution like this? Um, well, I guess the, the biggest uh, failures I had was after moving a few rounds. Uh, I was After City, I was actually uh, recruited by the buy side, uh, first time moving into a hedge fund industry. Uh, I started with um, a, a hedge fund, a boutique hedge fund uh, with 250 million AUM. 
those multi-strat fund. We have 13 people when we start. After four years of that, uh, we had grown to two and a quarter billion of AUM, and literally we were taking over from by the Sparks Group of uh, Japan, and the, the combined force was like 200 plus people. So that was wow. huge. <laughs> Yeah, uh, but after that, I, I, uh, when we sold the company, uh, my boss at that time, the macro CIO, had moved to work for Steve Cohen as SAC. And myself, I was recruited by Deutsche Proprietary Unit uh, to look after an a, uh, Asian ex Japan portfolio. That's where my biggest failure came in, unfortunately. Uh, this was the beginning of the, well, just prior to the beginning of the GFC 2008. Um, the first two months, I had huge wins. I was really up to my, my nose on, on uh, my revenue. So I, I took um, a, a working research trip to Vietnam where I met up with banks, uh, met up with treasuries, I met up with some uh, central banks, etc., to get an understanding of the, uh, the, the financial reforms that was coming. Because Vietnam previous year had just joined WTO. And uh, they were supposed to be the next uh, China on financial reforms, on trade reforms, on um, just huge fixed income uh, and equity market boosts coming through. So I end up purchasing um, more investments, uh, investing into the agency bonds, government bonds, and the foreign exchange of Vietnam until Bear Stearns got hit. So this was the beginning of the GFC when Bear Stearns got uh, literally taken over by JP Morgan for two dollars and then revised back up to ten. Um, and obviously, you know what happened afterwards with Lehman Brothers and and so on, so on. Um, uh, literally, my positions had no liquidity overnight, straight away, and I was just sitting on it, waiting, watching, bleeding, and bleeding and bleeding. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so my huge profit were taken away from me. <laughs> what can you do in those situations? Do you just wait or you have to find solutions? Or how do you react to those things? I think that was a really bad time because everyone got hit. Right? Uh -huh. Literally every single bank was hit left, right and center. Not just in particular of these government bonds or agency bonds. They were hit on CDS. They were hit on CDOs. They were hit on everything, foreign exchange, whatever. So people were very risk averse and they were reluctant to take over any risk that was didn't have to say the liquidity for them to get out. Right? Things just got worse and worse. Um, so even though I tried to liquidate the positions, um, but you know, I, I got out half of it, uh, but the rest you just literally have to sit through. And it's extremely hard uh, to sit through those situations, obviously, when everyone was panicking, they would just sell mm -hmm. first and ask questions later. Mm -hmm. And that makes me think a little bit of being kind of a small trader who trades for other people. So I guess you have to talk to the people you're trading for at some point. Yeah, 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 definitely. Um, you, you basically had to talk to everyone. You had to, you had to network in the market. You had to network in uh, uh, with your your own teammates. You have to network with your bosses and his bosses, etc. Because everyone was panicking, right? I mean, even the CEO of major banks were panicking, and most of them lost their jobs. Um, during the GFC, obviously, um, so so people were nervous, and they want to know why you're losing money every day. They want to know why you're not getting out of positions, and they want to know what is your plan or your solution to the existing problem, because they they at any single day during GFC they had ten problems on their plate, and they just want at least most of them getting off the plate as soon as possible, <laughs> and. Yeah, so how do you end all those situations? Because I guess it's one thing to have like a losing month and lose some portion of your account, but it's another thing to lose like that big in a situation like that. So how do you react? Because I guess it's a lot of pressure, like much more than just a losing month or a few months. Yes, I think that the, the point was prior to GFC, not since probably the, the Asian crisis, that people have experienced um, total dislocation of financial markets. Right, it was hitting the main street as well. Obviously, as you can see, that the direction coming out of the, uh, the central banks around the world, even today, we've not started to really unwind those kind of extra extraordinary um, quantitative easing and um, literally blowing up of central bank balance sheets and moving uh, the, the the private world into the government world. 
Like we were, even today, after 10 years since the what happened, we haven't done that. So you can see that how big it is, right? And I think that not since the 30s when the, the Great Depression hit us that we've experienced anything like that. And this time around, the magnitude of the numbers were, were much, much greater. Yeah. Right? And, and I think people, basically the entire industry has been flipped around and I, I don't even know if we ever, ever will cover fully into what it used to be. Wow. <laughs> pretty crazy. <laughs> Yeah. And what would be one of your main success as a trader like this an institution? I think um, uh, apart from the profitability, my great ex success will be to be able to gain so much mentorship and, and learning path. As you can see that from my path is pretty much that uh, I started off foreign exchange. I went to interest rates. I was uh, moving into the buy side the equities, the, the, the hedge fund industry. And then later on, <clears throat> I actually end up um, doing business development. <clears throat> Excuse me. I, I, I uh, tried to set up my own multi-strategy hedge fund uh, with two partners as well. One was a event-driven guy from Morgan Stanley and then a long-shot equity guy from uh, Mirai uh, Investment from, uh, from South Korea. Uh, we were going to get $100 million worth uh, C coming from uh, a Shanghai IPO, which uh, we spent a year on it. Unfortunately, it collapsed on, on the last minute and we couldn't get our C and basically spend our 12 months uh, losing time, money and effort uh, and pretty much devastation. So there's a lot of steep learning path along the way. Right? There's yeah. so much going on. Um, while I was doing that, I was actually uh, to get the cash flow. I was actually helping uh, a, the accounting firm Ernst & Young as well on the contract. I championed a... Um, a hedging strategy project in Seoul in Korea where Samsung Life Insurance uh, was needing to hedge their annuity program after GFC um, and they, they, they basically asked several consultants to, to present the project and I was uh, recruited uh, by a friend of mine who was a partner there to, uh, to launch our case and uh, we won that. So I went over to Seoul for six months and basically helped them set up the front back middle office and a hedging program for the annuity uh, insurance. So there's, there's so much uh, learning path going through, um, experience, intuition. Um, so I think that's that's the main gain I had, yeah. I think those are the times you learn best when you kind of have to learn or, you, or either you have to learn or you kind of fail and yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, it was like moving into something that is totally strange to me and saying, well, learn, grow, mature and reflect whatever you have. Um, otherwise, then just give up. And it was no time to give up. It was just you were too busy trying to swim forward to slow down because once you slow down, the sharks were waiting for you just right behind your tail. Absolutely. <laughs> I want to get to your training style a little bit, but before I kind of want to ask you, what are some of the lessons you got from your mentors? Like the top, let's say three lessons you got. Okay. Firstly is that basically there's no, there's no luck for the long-term trader. You get lucky. There's small, easy money one or twice. But if you're trying to look for the big trade or consistently over a number of years, if you don't do your homework, you don't have the fundamental knowledge of, of your trade, you don't have to stay in power. So as soon as things go wrong against you, you don't know why you're still in the trade. You, you keep getting out, you keep getting back in, you keep getting back out. You got no staying power, you don't have belief in that particular trade or the investment that you do. And I think that it's what distinguishes between the real good macro traders versus everyone else. Well, I, I guess um, um, apart from understanding various products and learning path, keep an open mind. I think that um, it, it's it's hard to to to. There are very much different traders in the world, right? So I think that the, the idea is to find your own edge. They are long-term traders, they're short-term traders, they're day punters, they're interest rate traders, the FX traders, equity traders, they're quant traders, they're model traders. There's, everyone is different. Um, 
but everyone might have started in a similar path as a traineeship under a mentor. I think the idea is to find your edge, find who you are, and find what path makes you comfortable, something that you actually benefit from it, something that you can enjoy your life and enjoy your career. Because it, it's very hard to wake up in the morning and go to work if you don't love what you do. Yeah. yeah. I think that's the main one too. So that brings us to uh, your style. So what will be your trading style today? Okay, I'm pretty much a fundamental trader. So the way I do things is I keep up to date with uh, world economic and geopolitical events. Um, and then I look at various economies uh, and then various markets around the world to look for discrepancies. So obviously I can't look for everything. Um, so I try to keep a uh, concentration of number of markets that I'm familiar with. Um, when I was uh, working for big banks with the luxury of uh, going onshore, I usually do go onshore. Uh, go and meet up with the local people, the local financial companies, the local banks, uh, even government institutions, central banks, uh, Minister of Finance, etc., to get an understanding of why things uh, are happening in their markets and with their particular economic fu fundamentals. So once I discover um, this discrepancy between the market and the fundamentals I believe in, I look for the most efficient way uh, on creating a trade or investment. Uh, so the efficiency will come from the risk versus reward. Uh, it's using options, the best reward versus um, um, risk for this particular discrepancy. Or is it, do I, should I use outrights on foreign exchange? Should it be interest rate play? Or should it be a bond play? Or should I just simply just use a credit play using CDS or moving into the copper bond market, etc. Um, so there is tools in the toolbox. It just a matter of deciding which one give you the biggest buck for for the uh, beta that's associated with it. Those are the things that are not necessarily kind of what new traders are going to go into. So how do you pick that kind of type of trading and why did you go that way? Yes, I, I don't think it's it's something that you learn on in six months, right? Uh -huh. I was lucky enough to be phone, well, not phone, to be recruited by different institutions on different desks uh, by the different areas of the market. Like my last venture was that uh, working for a Malaysian uh, May Bank of um, Malaysia, mm -hmm. uh, the biggest bank in Malaysia, uh, to handle uh, two portfolios. One portfolio was onshore China, uh, uh, credit market. So I look at what they call the NCD or the the negotiable certificate of deposits on the renminbi uh, issued by banks. And I also uh, do uh, uh, commercial papers by um, what they call the uh, state control uh, entities and enterprises from uh, mainland China. So they're commercial papers as well in renminbi. I also do an offshore uh, credit portfolio where I look at the both high yield and investment grade bonds in both dollar, euro, Australian dollar, and, and the dimson market, which is the CNH market. So um, I think there's always chance and ability for you to learn, but mm -hmm. yes, it's, it's, not, it's not always a clear path for anyone. When yeah. I started as an ethics trader, I had no idea eventually I would actually learn about interest rate. I had no idea I would learn about credit. I had no idea I would actually move from the sell side to the buy side. But the point is, just be ready, right? I mean, learn everything you can from where you are. And when that opportunity comes along, then you're ready to leave and move into the next path. And if you're given that opportunity, just jump at it, right? Especially when you're young. I mean, um, I'm too old to probably do too much jumping now. But <laughs> when you're young, when you're energetic, when you're dynamic, just do it. Take the risk. Right? Mm -hmm. Even though if there's a, a slight dip in your beneficiary on that short term, in the long run, it goes into the CV and you, you'll benefit from it. Right? Once you j learn everything, oh, you never learn everything. But once you have enough tools in your toolbox, then when opportunities comes up, where you actually have a selection of that tool for that particular risk versus what trade, you know what to do. And you started to trade probably as young as I did or probably in that area. 
what would be because I know a lot of people listening to this podcast are not that young. So what would be your advice for those people who start to trade like in their late forties or what would you recommend them? Well, it depends on if you're going to be a, a part time trader that with a normal regular job, regular life, or are you going to be a full time trader? Obviously it's it's always easy to make up your mind when your job is also trading, right? When you're hired by a bank or hired by a hedge fund and you literally don't have a choice. Your 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 world is surrounded by trading. So you learn everything from it, you learn from your mentor, etc. But if you have to do it part time on your own with a regular job, then you've actually got a lot to learn, uh, a lot on your hand. And uh, I, I would probably say that start very young if that's the case, um, you know, uh, because you know if you're just doing it part time, you probably it'll be five to seven years before you really have enough tools in your toolbox. Yeah, it could be very tough, right? Because uh, like I said before. You could get lucky once in a while, but you know you can't always fall back on your luck. You need that that uh, intuition, the fundamental in your base, to fall back on and to have the staying power in the trade when things don't go your way. And what do you think are the things traders kind of have to learn? Like whatever style they're at, whatever things they look at in the market. Do you do you see some things that like everyone has to learn all the time? I think it's always good to understand the fundamentals of the world. Uh, I mean, to, to, to be alert, right? You could be a short-term uh, arbitrager on, on the exchange, but you might not need that information for the fundamental side, for the economic uh, events that goes around the world. But you need to know it. You need to know when things happen, right? Just because you are being one or two ticks in the market and you're making a living out of it, if North Korea decided to send a missile that goes straight into Tokyo or Seoul tomorrow, that one or two ticks will evaporate straight away. The spreads will widen. You will not know what to do. But if you don't know the event and you haven't read the news and you don't know what it possibly could cause, you could be in quiet strife and you'd be panicking. The last thing a trader wants to be, it's continue panicking when event goes on and you have no clue. Yeah, yeah. At the same time though, I feel like events can make us panic when we don't know what to do. So if if let's say you see an event in the news, how, should you stop trading if you're not comfortable with it or should you try to analyze how things are and decide to trade or not? I think that's the point about preparation. If you understand beforehand that um, the, the, the nitty gritties of particular event, if you read about it, if you study it, and you know that it's most likely going to be the headline that comes through for the next week or next month or whatever, then then literally you have a plan in hand. It might not be a very detailed plan, but at least you know. You know that, for example, if Trump starts retreating against the North Korean missiles um, firing over Hokkaido this morning, for example, then you know that chances are he's going to talk something very aggressive. Then the market might sell off because of that particular treat. But the point is, unless Congress or UN follow through with his aggression on the wording, then chances are the market might not sell off as badly as um, the initial reaction will be. So there could actually potentially be some bottle fishing uh, relating to it. Um, there could be a, when China and Russia comes out, and try to put down a negotiation path uh, with North Korea. Maybe that when um, the US, South Korea and Japan uh, back off a bit and decided not to conduct any more military exercise on the front doorstep of North Korea, North Korea will also back off. They might come to the, the, the uh, negotiating table once again. So the initial panic might actually be a, a opportunity for you to create a strategy, a trade that will benefit in the medium term. But unless you actually done your homework and know anything about this whole event, you got no idea. You just simply panic sell and you might even go short the market and chances are you slowly get squeezed out. So, so that's how I would probably look at it. Just be prepared 
for when it happens, even though it might not happen. Yeah, I think I, I think that's fascinating. It's pretty interesting, and I'm probably the first one not paying enough attention to fundamentals, but it's something I I'll definitely look into for sure. Very interesting. <laughs> It's is good. there anything we didn't touch on that you would like to mention people or teach people something that they have to learn or apply? Um, I think there's a lot, lot to learn, a lot of path. Um, actually, right now I'm working, as you mentioned uh, about Mandy, right? Um, she's actually um, um, creating these uh, coaching courses where I'm working with her to... Um, to pay back to the world, pay back to the market participants. Um, so I think the industry has been done well for me. Um, it's actually um, allowed me a lot of opportunities, a lot of mentorship into my experience, et cetera. So, so right now I'm, I'm working with her in the sense that we're trying to give back. And um, I, I think uh, going forward, hopefully, there will be uh, a lot more information I could help to deliver to new traders or even experienced traders who who hasn't had the, the enough tools in the toolbox that wish to add more onto it. Mm -hmm. Pretty interesting. Do you consider yourself to be kind of retired from the institutional side or not completely? Well, I'm very happy to, to be back in Australia. I'm very happy to be settling back with my family. Um, I don't think... Uh, I, I think I'm still quite energetic and dynamic enough to continue the career path. Um, so I, I'm not retired from anything, put it this way. Um, uh, but I'm just simply uh, working, hopefully, to look for the next opportunity that would uh, bring another steep learning path to my, uh, my box of ticks. Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. So how can people find you if they want to connect with you or reach out after the podcast? Okay, um, so it's www.highperformancetrading.com.au. Um, right, I, I could send you those information yeah, as well. Yeah, so we'll make sure to put the link in the show to, notes yeah. for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Uh, so if they want to look for us and uh, they want to talk, they want to chat, they will just simply ask anything about uh, my career path or anything that I, I could uh, reflect upon. Um, I'm happy to help. Yeah, great stories. And what are your goals for the future? Um, I think moving forward, um, definitely family is a very serious goal for the future. My daughter enters um, high school in Australia and and uh, that's a big event, obviously. <clears throat> I'm uh, happy to be back here to, uh, to work on uh, this particular project with Mandy. Um, hopefully there'll be other uh, type of venture goes through um, on the career path as well. Um, the bottom line, the big goal is trying to stay happy, trying to enjoy the things I do and um, trying to matter to people around you. What's your main motivation for all this? Yeah, I, I guess, you know, if it's just for the investment trading motivation, I think it's always a good idea that you know that once you've done your homework, once you um, treat your mind and be ready for things, you could actually beat the market. You know, the market is efficient, but you could actually beat it. I think that's the whole point of um, being a trader, to, to have the ability, and when that result comes out and you've actually front run this particular vast, um, marketplace of so many individuals then you feel the honor right you think you've your work has come to a fruition it, yeah <laughs> it's kind of a challenge yeah <laughs> definitely <laughs> love it awesome well yeah i have this question i ask my guest at the end of every single podcast if you could give only one piece of advice for traders in one sentence what would that one sentence of advice be uh, don't rely on luck. Do your homework. Um, learn the fundamentals on things. Even though if you're a technical trader, just learn as much as you can on things because one day it'll come out that you need it in your toolbox. Awesome. Powerful, powerful. Well, Yang Feng, thanks so much for being on the podcast. It's been a pleasure to have you here. Thank you, Etienne.